Okay, welcome back everyone from the break. <clears throat> We're gonna reconvene the open session of the advisory council. We're coming back to a concept clearance that will be presented today on the multi-omics for health and disease. Um, before NHGRI can publish a funding opportunity announcement that has a set aside of funds associated with it, it must obtain concept clearance in an open meeting. We always use our council for that purpose, so the council is aware of all of the FOAs that are issued by our institute. So Joanna, Joanella Morales, Program Director in NHGRI's Division of Genomic Medicine, will present the concept to you, and we'll have a discussion answering questions from council. And when the discussion has run its course, I will ask for a vote to approve the concept. So Joanella, are you ready? Yes, I am, Rudy, thank you. Okay, take it away. So good afternoon, everyone. Today we are seeking council's input on a concept entitled Multiomics for Health and Disease. And I will be presenting the concept on behalf of our multiomics team, which includes Aaron Ramos and Terry Manolio. During my presentation, I will follow the outline you see on the slide. First, I will provide a summary of the preliminary discussions we had late last year with a subset of council members. And then I will proceed to describe the concept in a bit more detail. Okay, so first the preliminary council feedback. So during 2021, the NHGRI paid increased attention to the topic of multiomics. In June, 2021, we hosted a workshop entitled Multiomics and Health and Disease, where we convene leaders in multiomics technologies to discuss the state of the field and to gather recommendations on potential areas of research based on multiomics. As council may remember, in September 2021, or at the last council meeting, Dr. Chang and I provided a report on the proceedings and the recommendations that stemmed from the workshop. During the fall, our multiomics team started developing the concept idea. And in November 2021, we sought preliminary feedback from a subset of council members. I would like to point out that this represents a new approach to the concept clearance process. And so the goal here is for council members to have the opportunity to offer feedback early on in the concept development process and for program directors to have time to incorporate their input in advance of the council meeting. So in November, as I said, we met with the six council members listed here and we received very valuable feedback. So I would like to thank them for engaging with us in this way. So during the two meetings, we presented an outline of the concept and council members were generally enthusiastic about the concept idea and did not request a follow-up meeting. They did, however, have a few recommendations that I have listed here. We were encouraged to clearly articulate the primary objective and the desired outcomes, to increase the linkage between sample collection and data production, to centralize the data analysis while still ensuring the analysis remains a collaborative consortium-wide effort, and to expand the proposed list of omics assays. Now we took these recommendations into account as we finalized the concept that I am presenting here today. Okay, so next the background and rationale. As all of you are aware, recent advances in high throughput technologies over the years have led to increased access to distinct types of molecular data or omics data, some of which are noted here, genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. Now the concept we will be discussing today is focused on multiomics, which we have defined in the past as a systems biology approach where the focus is on the biological system as a whole. And the data sets of interest are, are the multiple ohms. And the hope here is that the integration of the distinct molecular layers will provide insights that go beyond what each single omic layer alone can produce. Now the systems biology approach implies a comprehensive assessment of the biological system, be that an individual, a tissue, or a cell, including the environmental exposures to which it is subject. This of course requires high throughput technologies and this generates a vast amount of big data that of course then requires interdisciplinary expertise to understand and interpret. Now multiomics integration has been shown to be particularly useful in a number of areas, including some of the ones listed here. For example, to improve the way disease subtypes are defined or to identify more precise biomarkers than the ones identified by single omics approaches, 
or to define relationships between omics data types, for example. And some successes have been recorded in the literature, though I note that most studies to date only include two or three types of omics data. Now, one successful example is shown here on the right, published by Lee and colleagues, and there they integrated genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics from multiple anatomical locations to improve the accuracy of classification of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease cases. Now, despite these successes, some gaps and opportunities do remain. For example, the production of multiple ohms from the same sample is still challenging. This is in part due to inter and intra-ohm variability, non-uniform content across platforms and assays, and the lack of consensus approaches for quality assessment and for dealing with missing data. Also, computational methods to integrate, analyze, and interpret data are still underdeveloped. For example, when integrating multiple ohms from the same sample or integrating multi-omics with other types of data, such as clinical and environmental exposure data, and also the lack of consensus approaches to integrate multi-omics across diverse populations. Finally, there is a lack of data collections that are prospective in their study design, that are consented for broad data sharing and general research use, that have well-described and harmonized metadata, and that are comprehensive in terms of the types of omics data that are included. And the concept we are discussing today aims to address some of these gaps and challenges. So now um, I will speak about the objectives and the scope of this program. So the overarching goal of this program is to validate and enhance generalizable multi-omic approaches to identify biological changes related to disease. And this will be done by establishing a consortium that will bring together experts to apply multi-omics approaches in several disease contexts. These experts will first explore the use of multi-omics to detect and assess molecular profiles associated with healthy and disease states. They will then leverage these exploratory studies to develop generalizable data harmonization, integration, and analysis methods, best practices, and standards. And finally, using all the data generated as part of the program, the consortium will create a multidimensional data set and a visualization portal that is available to the wider research community and is interoperable with existing resources such as TopMed, GTEx, and so forth. I would like to note that while this program may provide some insights into disease etiology for the diseases that are included as part of the program, the primary goal here is to validate and enhance generalizable approaches or to provide a set of established consensus-based methods, best practices, and standards that are generalizable across diseases. Now, this concept proposes three funding opportunity announcements to support a consortium that's composed of the three components listed here, disease study sites, omics production centers, and a data analysis and coordination center. I will now describe each component in a bit more detail. This concept envisions four to five disease study sites. We expect each site to propose a study focused on a disease area where there is evidence that integrated multiomics would be particularly impactful. Now, some examples are listed here, including relapsing diseases with exacerbations or heterogeneous diseases with clinically relevant subtypes or diseases that have clear or distinct stages or transitions. And the hope here is that these types of diseases would allow us to observe aspects of disease progression in the time frame of this prog program. Each DSS should also demonstrate the ability to recruit or reconsent a minimum of 200 to 300 participants. This could include, for example, two thirds of the participants with disease and one third of the participants without disease. But these controls from each site will be pooled and used as a consortium wide comparator group. And this group with a minimal set of standard phenotypic data will provide opportunities for standardization and quality control and will produce a unique data set that can be used in future analyses. The DSSs should follow appropriate consent and community engagement processes. 
should ensure that at least 75% of the participants are from diverse ancestral backgrounds, including persons from populations not well represented in genomics. And where available, the DSSs should use standard measures for phenotypes and environmental exposures, including social determinants of health. And finally, each DSS will also collect specimens at a minimum of three time points to account for baseline levels and disease states, for example, exacerbations, remissions, or treatments. The concept proposes one or two omics production centers, or OPCs, and the OPCs would utilize state-of-the-art high-throughput molecular assays to produce omics data from the samples including tissues and cells as needed that are provided by the participants that are enrolled and collected by the DSSs. Now the data types and assays that you see in the white box are currently in scope, though there is some flexibility for the OPCs to be innovative and suggest other data types. However, each OPC is required to propose a minimum of three ohms and one must be non-nucleic acid based, for example, proteomics and metabolomics. And this will, of course, ensure that these more challenging data types are included in the program. The third component of this program is the Data Analysis and Coordination Center, or DAC. And this center will work closely with the DSSs and the OPCs to receive, track, and catalog all the information on all the participants that are enrolled in the program. The DAC will also be responsible for the coordination of consortium-wide activities such as those that I've included, I'm including here, for example, building consensus on recruitment strategies and the choice of omics data types and assays, developing the consortium wide data analysis process, liaising with the ANVIL to facilitate data sharing, establishing working groups for methods development, producing the standardized multi dimensional data set with the characteristics that I've included here developing the visualization portal, and finally, rapidly disseminating consortium output, outputs and findings. We anticipate all the components of the consortium to work closely together to fulfill the aims of the program. In order to perform the collaborative analysis and the consensus-based methods development that we anticipate, all components of the consortium must have understanding and expertise in the following areas, multi-omics assays, computational and statistical integration and analysis methods, participant recruitment approaches, and community engagement strategies. This program proposes the first year to be a period for consortium-wide development, protocol development to discuss and make key decisions. For example, the recruitment strategy, the community engagement and informed consent processes, the core phenotypic and environmental exposure measures that will be captured, the omics data types and assays, and the procurement processing and analysis methods for the biospecimens that are collected. During the next several years of the program, all sites and centers are expected to contribute to data integration and analysis. It will apply computational approaches, interpret molecular profile associations, explore gene networks, and assess causal relationships. During this time, the consortium will also develop generalizable methods, best practices, and standards, and will create the standardized and harmonized multidimensional data set. Towards the second half of the program, we anticipate the consortium will work on developing the visualization portal following, following FAIR principles, and will increase activities to disseminate the methods, the data, and the findings to the wider research community. Now, one important area of emphasis for this concept is diversity. As you are aware, there is an overrepresentation of European ancestry individuals in research, and there are scientific and ethical challenges associated with this. For example, undiscovered genetic variation, the inaccurate risk prediction tools, or the inequity in the distribution of benefits from research. And for this reason, this concept proposes that a minimum of 75% of the individuals recruited by each DSS should be from ancestral backgrounds underrepresented in genomic research. Of course, to do this successfully, each DSS should establish 
recruitment, retention, and meaningful community engagement strategies, including outreach to racial and ethnic minority communities. There's also an increased understanding that the promise of genomics cannot be fully realized without a diverse genomic workforce. Therefore, to enhance the excellence and inclusivity of the research environments for this program, applicants are strongly encouraged to assemble study teams from diverse backgrounds, including individuals from underrepresented groups. Now, in terms of the relationship of this concept with ongoing activities, we view this program as complementing existing NIH investments, such as those that are listed here. And this, of course, is a sampling and not an exhausted li exhaustive list of the, some of the significant efforts in multiomics over the years. And while we view this initiative as, as being complementary to the other existing initiatives, we also note that it is distinct in a number of ways. It is its perspective enrollment and study design, the fact that it focuses on multiple disease areas and intends to collect specimens at multiple time points, aims to produce the major omics data types from the same sample, and it's seeking consent for future use and broad data sharing without data use limitations. And moving on to the budget, for this concept, we're proposing a, bud a budget of approximately 8 million per year and a program duration of five years. Therefore, the total budget for the five years would be 40 million. Of course, the total number of samples and sites will depend on the funds that are available at the time the applications are processed. So in summary, NHGRI proposes a new collaborative initiative to explore the use of multiomics to detect and assess molecular profiles, to leverage these exploratory association studies to develop generalizable methods, best practices, and standards, and to create a multidimensional data set that is available and interoperable with existing resources. Now, while we expect this initiative to provide insights into disease causes and disease biology, the primary goal is to validate and enhance generalizable multiomic approaches to identify meaningful biological changes related to health or disease. And with that, I'd like to thank the many colleagues who helped shape this concept. Thank you very much. And I will now turn things over to the three discussants to start the question and comment session. And I would like to first call on Dr. Howard Chang and then Dr. Storianskaya and Dr. Kulo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morales, uh, for the update and this exciting concept. Uh, so first, I'm very uh, impressed with how this concept has come together. Uh, I think the timing was ripe for this idea, this uh, idea of applying multi-omics to health and disease was something discussed in the NHGRI long-term vision and uh, has now really come together also from, with input from the community. Uh, and I, I like many of the components uh, very much. Uh, I think it reflects some of the uh, key aspects that were discussed in the workshop uh, that we both participated in, especially the idea of the, part, uh, the, the increased uh, diversity of the participants uh, and trying to really incorporate a range of technologies, including new ones, uh, that are being developed. One uh, sort of feature that I want to comment on is that as currently envisioned, there is a se separation of the disease sites that collect samples and an analysis center. And so it seems like that uh, this needs some really significant communication between the two groups because that the analysis center would then be expected to be able to basically work with very heterogeneous disease types that's going to be coming uh, from these different sites. And so I am glad that there is that one year planning at the very beginning to really think through how this will work together. Uh, but uh, this is something that I think, uh, because unlike one group proposing like, this is our disease, we're gonna collect this and we're gonna analyze it. Now we are, we're gonna have to have this connection that's gonna get a little bit, uh, you know, could be advantage to really harmonize and also look broadly across different disease uh, different kinds of diseases for common themes, but also there's a chance that you're really missing some of the key insights, right, that uh, topic experts may actually have. 
Thanks so much, Dr. Chang, for, um, for the encouraging words. And, and thank you also for your input. You were part of the workshop planning committee and also part of the subset of council members who um, provided input. And, and this point of that first year of, of um, protocol development, we do think it's really essential in order to provide that linkage that, as you mentioned, is required in order to make sure that the analysis and the production and are linked and, and, and are synergized and also to avoid doing analysis and silo that are then not, connect, not connected because obviously the goal here is to develop these approaches, these methods that are standardized and are generalizable across diseases. Any, any other questions on that point or if not, we'll move to um, Dr. Trojanskaya for her comments. Go ahead, Olga. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Indeed, a very um, exciting RFA. I think, uh, I think especially the perspective setup and the longitudinal sampling are very uh, important. And of course, uh, the emphasis of multi-omics is indeed very timely. And I really like the goal of uh, developing a data set that will really see the development of new methods for this. I think that's the right emphasis, especially for NHGRI specifically. Um, I do think, uh, you know, sort of uh, to follow up on uh, uh, Dr. Chang's point uh, about the, set, the, the fact that the disease uh, sites are separated from the analysis site, I would also emphasize that uh, that might be a challenge and we would need to make sure, or you would need to make sure that they uh, interface very closely. Um, and then to add to that, I would really put in some thought about uh, somehow seeding research or new methods development, uh, which it's tempting to say that that's what the DACC is going to do, but of course, an effective DACC is going to also mostly focus on really making the data accessible, harmonizing it, all of the things that you listed. And once they do all that, there's not that much time for methods development. So thinking about how to see that would be important. Um, and then finally, I think uh, one of the big strengths, but also challenges of this is diversity of every type, right? Uh, and that's, uh, of course, it's very exciting because you're emphasizing diversity of both samples and techniques uh, and diseases. And I think the key would be to make sure that there is really enough um, samples of a certain type. And by type, I don't just mean of the individuals of ethnic background. I also mean, for example, if metabolomics, let's say, is one of the subtypes, that there's not just a very small subset of samples that has metabolomics uh, coupled with respectomics, et cetera, so that there's enough to develop robust uh, analysis, but a very exciting initiative. I think this will be great. Thank you so much. And I, I did want to comment that we view the role of the DAC as, as being a coordinating center. So, so in fact, the analysis we hope will be done um, by all the components of the consortium working together. The DAC we, we, we wanted for there to be one component that can take responsibility for making sure that it, it gets from beginning to end or, or that, that the analysis is integrated. Um, we do understand that each DSS will have its disease area of expertise, uh, but the hope here is that all the components working together would, would produce the, the analysis and, and the development of methods, and then the DAC will serve as that coordinating entity. So I hope that that, that, is, that is clear. That sounds great. So the uh, individual disease centers would also have analysis expertise and would develop methods. Yeah, that, that, that would be very powerful. Yeah, that, that, is, that is the expectation here is that they would have the expertise to also be able to contribute to that analysis component. And Olga, I would add, um, <clears throat> Joanella mentioned that planning period, and that's a great opportunity for us. Once we see the applications that came in and were awarded, then we can sort of look at the menu of things that are in front of us. And like you said, make sure that we have sufficient sort of data sets so we can produce generalizable results. So, so thanks for raising that. Yeah, the planning period is a really smart idea. That's great. Okay, um, if there's no particular comment on this point, um, we'll, we can move on to Dr. Kulo for his um, comments. 
Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I like um, Olga and Howard. I'm very excited about this uh, particular initiative. Uh, I think it kind of heralds a new paradigm uh, in addressing um, biological complexity. Whereas we've hitherto used flat approaches, um, and unidimensional approaches, but this is a really a paradigm shift in that you're using multidimensional data and also you know, uh, temporal profiles of disease. So I think it heralds a new kind of era potentially in addressing biological complexity. And I think the groundswell is really apparent in how it's phrased in the strategic um, uh, vision that was published and also the feedback that you got from the focus conference. So there's obviously a realization that this is the next step you have to take to address, you know, disease complexity. Um, and I think I, I respect the fact that you recognize the limitations of this, that you are not really expecting tremendous insights at this stage, but you're setting the kind of the path for standards and methods development, because I know with these samples, you know, that might be a bit tricky. I mean, ideally you would have 10,000 people that you would sequence every year, uh, you know, see every year and you'd get um, some meaningful power for certain uh, events. But I think this is a great start. I just have three or four points that perhaps are worth discussing. Firstly, this is going to be have to have a tremendous um, emphasis on um, statistical analysis. You have potentially millions, billions of data points for maybe 500 individuals or 1,000 individuals. So this will require machine learning and other novel statistical approaches. So I think that has to be emphasized. Uh, the second unique characteristic is the uh, the multiple measurements over time. So that again has you know requires statistical approaches to address repeated measures. Uh, and also related to that, I wonder whether we should harmonize how data collection is spaced or multiple collections are spaced because. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it might be done after an exacerbation, but that would potentially not give you insights, you know, because of reverse causality, even when something happens, you get changes that um, are consequent to the exacerbation. So one option would be to uh, set aside, you know, spaced intervals. And if you get lucky, when you did the second um, measurement, maybe the exacerbation happened right next to it, and then you would be able to basically derive some insights into that. But I worry about doing it after an exacerbation because you would, you're perturbing the whole system and uh, you may not know what actually triggered the, mm -hmm. the exacerbation. So I think there may be some part uh, needed for that. Uh, the other thing would be uh, <clears throat> related to a presentation earlier today about the environmental factors and really making sure that we emphasize or have some element there to do a really good uh, granular assessment of uh, environment because then you'd have a really great data set. And same goes for phenotypes. Mm -hmm. If we can do deep phenotypes, then that will really complement, you know, the, the, the multi-omic approach. Uh, and my last comment is, uh, is this uh, at this point, just a single um, uh, initiative or, or do you feel that, um, this may have to be renewed, uh, or is this, this uh, something that'll let a thousand flowers bloom kind of a uh, thought here? So um, okay. so those are my overall, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about this. Okay, thank you very much for that. And great comments. Um, yes, I mean, I think the, the statistical component here is critical. And as you noted, we are hoping that there will be um, machine learning approaches and other um, important computational approaches here. The, the measurements over time, um, that, that also is, is, is key. And as you said, um, in terms of the spacing, obviously a lot will depend on the diseases that, that do end up being studied. At the moment, we don't know. Um, disease with exacerbation is one potential example, but it, we may end up with, with, with other types of diseases. But I think that first year of planning, that is part, I think, of what will be discussed for the longitudinal aspect of this 
Um, what is a frequency? When will it be done? I think all of those discussions we're hoping will take place during that first year. And then, yes, on the environmental component, um, we, we do hope, as I noted, also during that first year that their standard measures would be used. And, and for example, we have in mind existing tools like the Phoenix Toolkit, but we heard of that other program from the NIEHS director today um, that would be um, something also to, to consider looking into. Of the, for the last question, I'm not sure. Um, at the moment, we, we just were focused on this initiative and, and getting it off, off the ground with council approval. I don't know if, if uh, Aaron or Terry want to comment on that last, last point. No, I think that's a, um, a fair statement, Joanella. We do have some examples of programs like CSER where we felt <clears throat> it was evident that sort of a next phase would be really beneficial. And I think we'll have to wait and see a year, a year and a half or two into the program and then decide from there. Lisa, your hand is up. Yes, thank you. And thanks for the presentation. Throughout it, I was I was thinking of um, uh, features of the, the Common Fund uh, Bridge to AI, um, the prospective data set, the emphasis on uh, methods, tools development, development of best practices and standards. And then when Iftikhar you know, raises the issue of machine learning and, and statistical power and so on, is there any hope, interest in some sort of synergy between these two initiatives that seem to be sort of coming out at approximately the same time. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, so the, as I mentioned, there's a number of, of initiatives that are currently on, uh, working or in progress, but that there's, a, there's some that are of, um, getting off the ground right now. And we do hope that's why we emphasize that anything that we produce will be interoperable and generalizable so that it can be um, linked with other existing existing programs. And so certainly we would hope that um, the applicants or we would hope that once a consortium is formed that they would try to make clear links with these existing initiatives that would be so complementary. Okay, I've got Laura, Mark, and then Stephen. Laura, go ahead, please. Um, I have a question about um, tissue. And is there going to be a push to have the same tissue examined or allow different tissues to be examined, you know, given the disease? And then my other question is about over the lifespan of do we have, do we really know what children look like versus adolescents, adults, and then older adults? No, that's a good point um, about expanding. So, and we actually also heard this at the workshop that um, currently there's there's an overemphasis on using blood as the main specimen and that we should consider looking beyond that to, to the relevant tissues. I mean, of course, there's no, we don't know at the moment which diseases will be um, will be part of this program. So I'm not sure that there could be an exact match of the tissues that will be um, focused on, but certainly I think that that's something that, again, during that first year of planning and network and, and developing the protocols, um, those kinds of questions can be considered. In terms of, of the lifespan, um, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting point and something we're thinking about. It, I, again, I, I don't know what kind of diseases we will, we will get, uh, but that could, be, that could be something we consider. Mark, go ahead, please. I think this seems like a, a very interesting and worthwhile program. One thing that's not clear to me, however, is, is what is it about the program that makes it fit squarely within the NHGRI mission, right? As opposed to being a, a common fund or NIGMS or some other institute project. And, and one thought there, maybe it's a question, is has to do with the, the diseases selected. So will there be emphasis or priority on diseases where the genetic basis of the disease is, is especially murky or is are there other aspects that you think make this uniquely uh, a unique fit for the NHGRI mission? 
Again, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think the NHGRI has had some experience looking at general, uh, at trying to to see what the community is doing, and then coming in and and proposing a work on developing methods that are generalizable. And so, I would say, from that standpoint, this fits within NHGRI's mission. Um, in terms of the diseases, again, we we are not limiting. Um, we don't have any specific criteria at the moment of which diseases um, we would, uh, in other words, we don't have a priority list at the moment. We would, we would review the diseases as they come through the application process, but we don't have any set priority at the moment. I, I don't know if that answers the question, but that, that is how I would answer that. I would also add, Joanella, that thinking about um, emerge and, and going way back to some of the first uh, GWAS consortia that we helped stand up. It was really beneficial for the, um, the consortium to have the experience with multiple different types of diseases. And then it sort of led to, I think, more robust and generalizable methods and sort of approaching the data integration in a way that could be, again, more robust um, and useful for the, for the broader community. Steve Rich. Yeah, I, I, you know, I love the idea of multi-omics, even though I don't quite understand it or know how to analyze it yet, um, to be all honest. But the, the couple thoughts came to mind. One was the general NHGRI concept of data accessibility, which was historically, as soon as the data is produced, it's out there. I, I think it's really going to be important uh, as part of this, that when the data are produced, that it doesn't get restricted just to the project teams, that it does become available to the scientific community, because that's one way of stimulating development of novel methods and ways of approaching it. So I, I think that's one thing that could be very, you know, could be helpful just to see that stated. Um, another aspect of that, of course, is making uh, available smaller analysis grants uh, through other sort pots of money that that hopefully you know Eric will have stashed in his back pocket to help stimulate uh, analysis of these these important data uh, uh, another thought came about flexibility and ability to incorporate new technologies um, you know, what we know today is probably not going to be what will actually be useful uh, in the future, uh, even probably a year or two years from now when things get going after the one year discussion period. So I think it's going to be important to figure out from the standpoint of the data production teams, just how flexible and nimble they are to, to move to new technologies. Uh, Cause that's, you know, the, the omics we know today may be different than the omics we know later. And I guess the final thing, and I hate to say this, uh, and I'll defer to Peter on this, it almost sounds like you need a mod version of, of this project. Um, and I'm thinking about the variety of, of mouse strains that can be used and the types of tissues that can be accessible and being able to generate that type of data and use having maybe parallel of a, a model systems approach as well as a human approach. Um, and just thinking, because you know, certain things you can get from people, but you can get them from a mouse a lot more easily. Maybe Peter can comment after after uh, you know we get past Stephen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for all of these comments. They're really helpful um, as we think, especially hopefully, when the concept gets approved and we think about writing the funding opportunity announcements. All of the comments that you made are really helpful in terms of clarifying and making clear um, some of some of these points. So thank thank you for that. Steve Carter. Um, oh, yeah, I want to pick up a little bit on what Steve was just getting at the last point. And that is that, you know, a lot of these technologies are at very, very different states. And, um, you know, for example, a DNA sequence database has a lot higher level of precision than maybe an epigenetics uh, database or um, you know, depending on what you choose for metabolism and so on, these could be very different. And it seems to me that 
there may be an opportunity here in the early days to put a special emphasis on where are the holes in the technology. And in fact, you know, articulating that can also help programmatically in which technology development um, efforts should be going on and so on. And so I, I, I think, you know, and I like the comment about simplifying if possible uh, for model organisms uh, so that you can actually be more comprehensive and actually know what works before you go through huge standardization or huge um, expansion. So I, I just think there's a real good opportunity here for direction in the very early days of uh, thinking about where are the holes in the technology? Uh, are we actually getting the correct data and so on in order to accomplish this? But I, I love the project and I think it's uh, very timely. Thank you. Yeah. I, oh, go, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joanna. No, no, no. I, I was just gonna say that on, on the technology point, this is a part of what we were also thinking that you know, while this concept is not focused on, on technology development, we, we figure that putting this consortium together would, would allow us to see some of the gaps um, for other potential opportunities, research opportunities. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely agree with what, what Steve is saying. Um, for me, I think methods are, are going to be one of the most important things and, you know, any bioinformatician worth their salt would be able to come up with something to do with the, the multi-omics data, but we don't really have any any tried and true methods right now because there aren't that many multi-omics data sets that, that are, are really, you know, well tied to clinical data. And so I, I think we're going to need um, a, a lot of methods development, and I would encourage you uh, not to necessarily keep that with just within the centers, but to, as Olga, I think, was suggesting to create some smaller grants to kind of spread around the creativity. And obviously to make sure that the data is, is available to all those who, who, who want to try it out, whether funded or not. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing I'd like to suggest, and, and um, uh, uh, there's a slight conflict of interest because I was involved in this, but the, the GA4GH is, uh, has just published uh, something called a Pheno packet, mm -hmm. which is a, a computational um, schema for um, capturing long, longitudinal clinical data, including phenotypes, treatments, measurements, and a few other things. And um, I, I think it's not enough to capture the ontology terms. It's, it's better to capture the data in a, in a schema such like this that's computable over, over the course. So you might want to look at that. Okay. Um, I, I think the value, I mean, this, I'm probably stating the completely obvious, but, you know, the value of the model organ the mouse data um, might be that you know if you if you took um, a, a certain number of strains available at JAX, there this is basically a model for precision genetics where we you know we have the, the genomes already we understand a lot about these mice and you know we can do multi-omics in much the same way and we can also do interventions to validate things and so having a, a component of the program uh, for for mouse studies might allow us to kind of understand the genomic rule book a little bit better for how how to put together all of the multi-omics um, data sets to actually discover uh, therapeutically relevant strata in the, in, the, in the populations. Thank you. Rafael. Yeah, so hi, Joanna. I wanted to follow up on Peter's comment with just an experience dealing with multi-omics data. That I have had I have had to do every once in a while with my collaborators, and it's that every almost every time, well actually every time we do it, it's and we have to come up with something new. It's very specific to the problem, so just something to keep in mind when, you know, coming up in you know, developing this concept, that it, it it's you want to think about the possibility that every every single problem will have a different solution. Or, or maybe there's some way to, to, to abstract it. I, 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 it's not clear to me yet, but it's something to keep in mind because it, you know, you might, you might want, you might be asking people to do the impossible if you're asking them to come up with a method that just does multi-omic analysis. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that comment. Yeah, certainly it's gonna be complex. The data is complex and that's part of the challenge.
Sure, right. But I, I'm, I guess the specific, like, the specific comment is that it could be very problem specific so, so that general solutions might be hard to come by. Um, so just a recommendation not to be too optimistic about that. Okay. Pal, go ahead. So I, I too am uh, very positive about this concept. I, I want to explore a bit the, uh, the consideration of the diseases um, and the wisdom of being completely agnostic um, to what diseases are studied. Uh, you know, it seems like a strong rationale could be made to pick ideal diseases for the purpose of developing paradigms for the use of multi-omics data. Um, those might be diseases um, where multiple tissues are involved, um, the types of transitions that you were describing are routine and expectable, um, where there are strong hypotheses about how multi-omics data could be complementary to each other. Um, and there, in, in that light, I, I wonder about um, the wisdom of creating too many obstacles for the recruitment center, you know, to say you have to be able to collect 300 of these people and 75% of them have to be underrepresented minorities that the barrier, the, the, you know, the bar may be too high to let a group recruit sufficient numbers to really achieve the purpose. And I understand that's not necessarily to fully understand a disease, but rather to develop paradigms. So, uh, you know, we've discussed this before, but the, it seems to add weight to the concept of allowing recruitment sites to band together um, to recruit enough people that would allow the exploration of an ideal um, disease for this purpose. Okay. Yeah, how I would just add um, in the concept, like you said, I don't think we're necessarily, we're not agnostic in that we want the investigators to justify diseases where omics are particularly Im impactful. And then I think your point about allowing um, researchers to come together as a network or a group makes sense and that that would be um, allowable. Um, and we could describe that in the, the FOAs when we write them up. Other questions or comments about the FOA? <clears throat> Okay, can I get a motion to approve the concept? And a second? Second. Second. All in favor, please raise your hand and keep it up for that long. Thank you very much. Anyone opposed? Rafael, are you opposed? There we go. Anyone abstaining? Okay. Joanella, Aaron, thank you very much. Council, thank you. That was a great discussion. Thank you so much.